That fun new greeting sound. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, and there's Leslie. And more. <laughs> and Lynn. All right. So I thought we might start today by going over the changes to the map since the last meeting. A thousand windows open here. I'm gonna bring up ArcGIS. Um, so the changes that have been made since the last time we met um, were in response to comments from this group and the conservation group about um, wanting the hamlet zones to not necessarily follow the parcel lines um, and to more closely replicate um, kind of our, our theoretical planner distances of half mile radius circles and quarter mile radius circles. Um, so oh, there's Catherine. I thought it was already here, but. <laughs> She may have left and come back. <clears throat> so I'm going to share my GIS screen and we can do a quick look at that. Hopefully uh, most of you have had a chance to look at it in the shared document, but it can be easier on the screen. So I'll start with the central Hamlet. Zoom in here. Um, if you hear weird sounds behind me, let me know and I'll ask my family to be quieter in the next room. Um, so we were looking at this quarter mile circle for what used to be called North Danby um, and then two half mile radius circles. Um, so we've reduced the parts of these parcels that had previously been in um, with a straight line across. It's the same for both of them. Um, I also transitioned some of these lots that are really in the circle or close to the circle that had been pink um, to the Hamlet neighborhood designation. Okay. Um, and added um, at the request of the group a little bit of the Hamlet neighborhood on a piece of this parcel, the piece that's not in the habitat corridor and mm -hmm. is within the, the quarter mile circle there. So um, with those changes, there hasn't been any change to the, the Hamlet center or Hamlet core extents. Those are the same as they have been. Um, How does the, uh, the habitat, habitat uh, areas there affect the Hamlet? Well, we haven't really um, figured that out yet, I would say. Um, I mean, what is, uh, what are we supposed to be, how are we supposed to be reacting to the fact that these areas have been identified as wildlife corridors? What are we supposed to do with that land to preserve them as wildlife corridors? Yeah, well, it's essentially a buffer of the stream. Um, so our consideration of how we want to deal with that in the hamlet um, will parallel how we think about the, the streams, I think. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, how is it that Route 96B for a few hundred feet is itself a habitat corridor? Just, it's sort of a, just a visual anomaly. Where's that? Um, to um, where this, it's, it's actually centered on the stream, but it does include um, 96B there. Yeah, because the stream the stream. is so close to the road. Yeah. Yeah, it's so close to the road. I. I <laughs> but why is the corridor on only the east side of the stream when it would might make more sense if we were on the west side of the stream? I would guess it just has to do with the the data that it was based on um, being oh. being a little rough. Yeah, I mean, I I find it hard to believe that the um, McLean, oh, McLean barn oh. as a habitat corridor. That's <laughs> gravel. And well, I do think, though, that considering that 
that Wes and Corbett had an otter in their pond the other day. That otter most likely came down along the creek corridor that runs through their property and probably got to that creek corridor by coming through some other creek corridor. So these creek corridors can be, uh, can be very helpful to wildlife. And we have salamanders that breed in the creeks and fish and crayfish and all of that sort of thing. So the creek corridors are helpful, but my question really is, uh, you know, I, I have been wanting all along to do something with Buttermilk Creek behind the town hall. We are really not um, taking care, we are not being stewards of that creek. And uh, in my opinion, we ought to be. Well, what would stewardship look like to you? I think I would bring in a creek specialist and say, what can we do to, in, to make this creek better, right? And how can we prevent runoff from salt, for example, into the creek? Um, are we allowing people to park too close to the creek because they might drip oil or something like that that could flow into the creek? Uh, there are any number of things that could be done. We really need to have creek specialists come along and, and write a report on how we can better be stewards of the creek. So on this side of the cabin. Yes. Okay, so, you know, managing runoff seems, that seems like an important thing. Um, shading might also be, because uh, in, in developed areas, the, you know, the shading is important to the creek temperature. And it's a thing to keep in mind. But right That's behind the, the town hall, just using that as an example, uh, it looks to me like some large tree at one particular time fell down into the creek. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? It, it kind of slows down the flow of the water, but is it impeding fish and other things from getting up the creek? Well, I mean, anytime a tree falls in, it tends to make the creek go around it, which it promotes erosion on the opposite bank. But <clears throat> so we can... You know, these are things to talk, think about, especially in the middle of the hamlet. So I see, David, you focused on West Danby now. Um, what, which cha what changes were made there? Uh, similar to the central Danby hamlet, we've um, sliced some of these other parcels in uh, where the whole parcel was in before, but people wanted to see only part of it. As you can see, I've kind of followed where the steep slopes um, start to uh, cut mm -hmm. in on on these other these parcels to the north to include some of the parcel but not all of it um, and i still maybe. feel that the town's parcel should be green i agree because it's, it's also quite steep there um, it would be unlikely to develop it as well mm. that's right next to a wetland with a heronry in the right. parcel the parcel under syl right That, yeah, right there, right. That's mm -hmm. the town's piece. You think that should be the dark green? Yep. If I know other reason, it, it's it's where it's the wellhead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good reason. I think it's covered under the aquifer protection overlay too. And what about the the parcel under A N? Uh, good question. That's Gene Beaver's property, isn't it? Yes. Does he have any feelings toward his property? Well, Gene he passed away uh, several years ago. Oh, yeah, he's dead. I didn't even know that. But his son is there now, um, and he he feels well. He he regrets uh, his, his stepmother having sold the southern part of that property to the land trust. <clears throat> oh, really? Because it. I mean, limited usability for agricultural purposes, which is his intention. Hmm. What kind of agriculture? He was keeping, uh, well, they had beef cattle. Next to a wetland? Yeah. Oh, dear. So perhaps that, that parcel might, might be a light green.
Well, I mean, it's not unreasonable to, to, to zone it for potential future development there. Does it have any particular soils, agricultural oh, soils? Not no. really. I know someone who's growing, um, you know, just trees and things on some of the moraine habitat. And boy, that plants really grow well there. I, I was surprised. It doesn't look all of that um, fertile, but the fact that it's it, it has a certain um, looseness to the soil, uh, I think the, the, the plants really love it. Well, the, 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 the better part, the better soil was south of Sylvan Lane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little more concerned about the expansiveness of the light orange uh, all the way to the edge of the water district on the north side, uh, outside of the circle. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk about that? Because, uh, well, that that is, it's a pretty decent agricultural land there. It's not being used agriculturally, but, um, and it still feels pretty rural. These are the class one and class two soils in pink. In pink. Yeah, the trouble is the soil classifications depend in part on slope. Mm -hmm. um, I'm surprised it doesn't class better though. Yeah, there's there's a little slope in there, not a lot. Yeah, I mean so, to say that that um, that area was mined for topsoil by Roy Castelline. Mm -hmm. uh, really, what did he do with it? He sold he it sold to it? people. You know, West Danby Clay. You know, <laughs> it's a it's a uh, it's a it's a silt verging on clay, uh, which makes it rather erodible, but also pretty good agricultural soil. It's, it's, it's quite well drained. All right, so um, Joel, is your proposal to say remove those parcels from the Hamlet neighborhood? Um, you know, you'd yeah. like to see changed? Yes. Does anyone have any uh, other thoughts, different thoughts, want to Suggest not doing that? No? I really don't know that area at all, but I'm wondering what these um, these buildings are. Are they just houses? Are they barns? Um, There's a church right there, isn't it, Joel? Yeah, I think that's probably the big the big black blob is the church. It's the church. Uh -huh. And it's a little bit high up off the road, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's up in the road. Everything. So, yeah. yeah. And where where is uh is Corey Bakalowski's place somewhere around there? Yep, across the street, uh, just over. Um, the collection. It's Corey's, it's Corey's place, and across the street from it, the big open field, where a new house was built recently, but still mostly open field. Um, that it would be nice to have retain that character. And what about uh, the Cayuga Inlet? Um, what about it? It's, it's way over. It's not there. It's, um, it's where that habitat corridor is on the right. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments, or concerns about the, the map? map yes, areas? well, we decided um, that down where the Sylvan, the word Sylvan oh, is. Is this brown one? I don't know. We decided where the word Sylvan is on the map. Short road. Um, there's a, a tiny down. sort of a square there. That should be green because that's actually Finger Lake Land Trust property. They uh, have an, I think, an easement on that property. Don't you think, Joel? Isn't that what that is? Which one, are, which one are you talking about? Yes. That house there? Or is that the fire department? That's the fire department. That's, that's the, the fire, fire department. department. Well, we can still leave it green then. There, there's a question for you, David. In general, properties known to have conservation easements, were they singled out for dark green or just merged into whatever? No, whatever is um, we're not changing the zoning based on easements, only ownership. So if Finger Lakes Land Trust owns the property, 
it's green, but just having an easement doesn't um, put it in that zone. And did Joel say that really he wanted the an AN easement. to be a light green? Was that what you said, Joel, about the Beavers property? No, that was that was Ted's suggestion, actually. Oh. I'm okay with it being um, pale orange, just because it's not that great a soil. It wouldn't be that bad if it were developed at some point. Yeah. The, I, I wonder though about what you just said, David, about you know, our properties protected by conservation easement are essentially more protected than the, the preserves. Mm -hmm. and, and quite protected. So I mean, I, 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 they might as well indicate that they're sort of out of, out of play. I don't think there's any utility to that. If uh, I think then you're putting some extra you're putting extra requirements on somebody who's already voluntarily accepted a bunch of restrictions and you may come up with a weird overlap that makes things more difficult. Except that the restrictions they accepted are, well, maybe it has to be examined, but aren't they more restrictive than the dark green? They, they may they're, be, they're if they, that's, the, that's the thing. If they are more restrictive than the dark green, then there's no purpose in making it dark green because they're well, protected by an easement. The, the purpose might be to give more of a feeling to what's around it. I think yeah. also we had discussed that, I have my screen pushed back so I can see all the colors, but I think that um, we had discussed the fact that it would be good to have all of the easement parcels identified in some way, maybe by a special color, so that no, we could that, see if there was not, any clustering. It's not zoning. We're, we're oh. the, no, it's yeah. true, but you know, but but it also doesn't make sense to zone for something that can't happen on a property. I think it does. Most zoning includes allowing things that are not possible on a particular property within that zone. But the if zone we had is, a cluster of of uh, easement holders together, that would tell us how we should be zoning around it, I would think. Or at least giving us some sort of a hint to how we should be zoning around it. Well, I mean, but yeah, but, but, but taking David's argument one step further, why then do we have dark green? Well, that's most of the dark green is the Danby State Forest. Yeah, but um, and it also includes, you know, land trust preserves. I also am not, I'm not, I'm not totally sure that Ron is right about that idea of, of one type of zoning indicating what the contiguous areas ought to have. I thought we had talked several meetings ago about the idea that a sharp transition is actually in some ways a better idea. I, I thought we got a sort of a mini lesson from David on the idea that, uh, Having having these blends or transitions was not necessarily the best idea, and I concur with that judgment. Yeah, so, so there, there's nothing wrong with sharp transitions, as if we're deciding the zoning based on what each unit really ought to be. Right, and well, within the realm of what can be. Right, which is well, why no, no, that, and in fact, David said. You know, well, the, yeah, the but does, well, I guess what the argument here is whether or not it makes sense to include in a zone. Well, well, obviously, if it's an inholding, it'd be one thing, but but to uh, include a property mostly in the zone where it can't yep. be used for what the zone is zoned for. Right. Does that make sense? I yeah. think it does. I think most Except zones. It doesn't. Allow... And I get... oh. Go ahead, Jonathan. You want to take no, I think we're up to say there are all sorts of situations where a zone might be different than what's actually possible in the property. Yes. So that's, that's there's nothing wrong with that. Well, it, but I, <clears throat> I, I see the point that you just made, John, and it, it's perfectly sensible, but yet the map also includes, for example, habitat corridors which <laughs> I would think in an easement would be, should 
be even more in, important because it shows how the land, what, what is restricted, what you can't do on it. An easement is a choice and, and there's a whole range of types of easements. Some of them are very mild. There are four types of easements. So yeah, but an they easement all... is a choice that someone's made. But, and but they all it, part of based on Yes. Yeah, but they all preclude, no, they, you know, no, further re additional residential development. Well, not necessarily, Joel, but they at least inhibit it. They, there might be defined permissions to build things, but it, those permissions are, I assume, to be less than anything you could do otherwise. Otherwise, what's the point? Right. Exactly. Oh, let me ask you this. This is supposed to be a zoning, it's supposed to be a zoning map. So, it, do we need to call it something else if we want the map to be the most helpful rather than a zoning that, map? That, that suggests that there should be a, a color for properties with zoning, sorry, with <laughs> conservation I, easements on them with the understanding that each one you ha has to be examined carefully in terms of the, uh, written, of the written agreement. But we should know they're are, there. Are we trying to come up with zoning? Aren't we trying? Isn't that point? I mean, over this nine months, yes. aren't yes. The, the advice is towards zone. And ha having other notations is fine. That's why there's a wildlife corridor. That's part of the guide. Well, that's part of the principles we're using. So I agree with you, Ted. Some kind of notation that says mm -hmm. here are easements is fine, but that shouldn't dictate the zoning. No, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. It should inform. It should inform the zoning. Right. I was right. never right. implying that it should dictate the zoning. I no, was it, just yeah. saying it, it's a that, marker that there is special zoning on that one property. And I'm, I've scrolled not, over on, on my screen it's to look at Tim. Yeah, is there some way we could we could add like uh, like you have the the, hot, the habitat corridors with the you know the, the lines or something, either a different color or or stippling or something for protected land. What about a separate map of so, all the conservation units? Yeah, so I. Well, it could be an overlay, I suppose. We we already have too much going on on this map to even be readable, and I'm we're not we can't add another layer of things. I mean, an easement is a, in most cases, is a private contract between uh, a nonprofit and a property owner. It actually has, most of them have nothing to do with the town. It's really none of our business. Um, but, you know, outside of zoning, if we want to do a map, you know, if the CAC wants, or somebody wants to have a map of where our conservation easements, I think that's maybe a, a totally useful thing in the planning of conservation. Um, but I, I'd like to move away from talking about it on the zoning map, just from the practical standpoint of, we already have too much visually to even see on this map um, with what we're currently considering. You know, I, I do mean, think it has, it has an important to, relevant to too. zoning. Because if you have a number of a lar either a large parcel that is an easement or you have a cluster of easements and someone comes along and proposes to put right near there something that would really infringe on the goals or the expectations of the easement holders, then we have to consider that. We have to know where these easements are so that we we help protect them and I mean we have a certain stewardship yeah. relationship that would come them. up in site plan review that would come up in site plan review Rhonda I agree with you but it's not something that you put into zoning it's, it's, it, it it's also important it's a, it's also important to note that an easement is an agreement with another party about something on your parcel putting an easement on your parcel does not require your neighbor to do things to right. not impact the what you, what you've done on yours, right. on your property. But the yeah, easement holder is the town right. in this particular case. So we have a stewardship relationship to this, these parcels. We are the ones. It doesn't but, take but, away but, from the property rights of a neighboring property though. Right. Well, David, but you, what you're saying is correct. But the thing as I've been sitting here listening is that just makes me shiver is saying we need to, um, how Joel said it, Joel said it, but 
you can't preserve private land without buying it from them or buying the rights to preserve it. You can't tell people with class one, I don't even know if there are class one soils in Danby, but class two soils, the better soils, you can't preserve that ground and say you can't develop it. It's just you're taking away people's rights without buying those rights. And I don't even think you can uh, intentionally force people to sell those rights if, if they don't want to. If they, it's private property. Um, we can try to preserve it, but you can't force people to preserve it. And that, that's one of my arguments. I brought it up to the uh, group with uh, farmland preservation because they're going to be talking about this. I said, well, in New Jersey, where I grew up, um, farmers are allowed to sell their development rights and it goes into the farmland preservation program, but they get paid five to $10,000 an acre for their uh, development rights on the property. Uh, unless the town or the state's willing to do that, I don't think we have any right to zone it that this cannot be developed or to reduce the uh, ability to build on class two soils. Well, the catch is that they have given up in some fashion those rights. And I've been looking at what I think is an example of- I don't Wait a minute, how, how, Ted, how, mean? how have people like us who own, and Sapans who own the class two soils of Danby, Given up our rights. It's like we're being punished because we have the you, better. You, have, you haven't, and but you don't have a conservation easement. That's correct. the point. Yeah, but if you zone it that way, then you're taking no, away. No, 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 we're not going to zone your people. property. We're zoning okay. the guys who do have conservations. Gotcha. Easement. Makes sense. And, yeah, and my, I was trying to give the example. I think Tim DeVote uh, has a very large fairly large property on Miller Road, which uh, has an easement with the um, land trust. Mm -hmm. And if I, if, I, if I see it right, uh, it's sort of uh, north of the, RD, of the D of East Miller Road, uh, if, mm -hmm. if you can scroll over there for the folks. Well, this is kind of off topic for us though, Ted, which should be part of the conservation group discussion because we it, should it, be focused on the hamlets. It, we should be, but it hasn't stopped us talking about it for the last five minutes. <laughs> um, well, the, the, what's relevant is the is land that's protected by easement within our target. Right. If but we why look at it as a target, you know, within the circles that we've drawn on the why map. Why not try to make a resolution here so we don't have to talk about it there? <laughs> or at least present, present a, 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 a given opinion. Um, keep, keep going to the east a little bit more. And somebody who knows the property better than I do can probably can can tell me if it's right. Um, I'm thinking. I, I know you're right, but I'm not sure that I could point to it. Um, I'm thinking. Oh, oh dear, I've lost Miller now. There, it's okay. The is, exact parcel doesn't really matter. What's what's your point? Um, the the point is that. It, it, it's it's a parcel that I think right now is is done with the uh, square square pattern. Yeah. Um, and in fact, its uh, its restrictions make it more likely to be um, more restricted than that. Bottom line. That's and the so, owner's choice. It, that's the that's owner's the choice. Owner's, that's the so owner's. We, well, it's that's the same to thing. Do with if I said make make my parcel uh, dark green for for protection, that's my owner's choice. But they've already made their choice. Yeah. Why don't we indicate it on the map? But that's that's not part of the um, Hamlet meeting, which is tonight. That's next week's. Can we just do this week's? Well, as I just said, we're, we we're well down this road. We could at least uh, come out with a consensus that we can tell. The, kind of the other group, the not Hamlet group about. Well, the, can we, the, can, the we ask really the CAC to, can we ask the CAC to do a map with the location of all the, the, the easements in Danby, whether it's town, and maybe it could be town and Finger Lakes Land Trust differentiated. We could just ask for, ask for a map. Seems like we've got that already, don't we, David? Mm -hmm. I really map haven't seen it. Map or protected land. Okay, well, let's not talk, let's talk about zoning now. Yeah. Well, but no, but uh, you know, we're we're uh, we started out making the dark green uh, based on the fact that it was already protected land, basically. It was state-owned, town-owned. 
um, yeah. protected land. State and this and this is protected land as well. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, it's, technically, it's not no, really it's, protected. It's, it's, no. a, it's a contract. It's, it's actually a broachable Personal. contract. It can be legally broken. It's just difficult, which right. is very different than zoning. It can be changed. Zoning can be changed, right. No, I'm saying an <laughs> easement can be changed and therefore is totally different than zoning. Exactly. You, you can get out of an easement. It's much easier, much easier to change zoning than it is to change the conservation easement. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's easier to get a zoning variance. Yes, Ugh. yes. Or for the right. town. Right, yeah. right. Um, anyway, it, it, but my point, which got kind of lost in this, I think, is that you know, in in drawing our lines and where we where, where we think it makes sense to to do things, it, it seems to me it makes sense to look at what the constraints are, and you know we've, we're looking at we're looking at riparian corridors and we're looking at wetlands as, as constraints. Why should we not also look at, you know, protected land as also being a constraint? It limits their ability to do whatever you want to zone for. And it ought to inform the, the decision regarding what areas are included. I and mean, if we find that between, you know, between protected lands, wetlands, preparing corridors, there's not much area, then we might want to make the, you know, the area bigger or at least recognize the, what, where our limitations yeah. are. It might inform where, where we want the hemp to grow to. Yeah, um, I, I, I'll second what Joel said. You know, knowing what's around a parcel might affect our decision about how to zone a different parcel. Should we take Should we take a vote and see where people are with this idea? No, we don't know what we're voting for. No, I, I I'm sorry, but it, it seems to me like there, people are making many suggestions and arguments. To, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this, but for the sake of disagreeing, and we I feel as though we're off the topic. Zoning, we, we, if you want to do that, then we're going to have to define exactly what parameters of zoning and exactly the parameters of conservation and then make this decision. In the meanwhile, this is about zoning for the hamlet, as what I understood. Yes. I, and I do have company, so I may not be paying fully attention, but I think we should stay on topic. I think we should stay on topic as well because we have two separate groups Agreed. and there's no sense in overlapping right, right, the two right. groups and, and in addition we have this whole details that we started last week about the difference between the two hamlet zones and I think we need to look at those very carefully. We haven't even started, barely started on that and those are the details of what those zones have available. Yes. Yeah. My, my one I question agree. was based on the last planning meeting um, and looking at a, within the Hamlet zone that was on the creek is how are we going to deal with that in future planning meetings? Because if we're proposing more development in this area and we're going to keep getting recommendations from the county for not for recommending against these kind of developments within 100 feet of the creek. creek it's going to impact a lot of this area that we're designating as Hamlet development. It is. I so think that's we just have to be aware that either the planning board's going to have to routinely vote against that recommendation from the county or we, I, I don't know, somehow in some way deal with the creeks. Well, you're right. Absolutely. It's, it's one of our biggest constraints on the, on the west side of the highway. Uh, if we were to do a hundred foot in that Hamlet development zone, it would, it would severely limit what could be done uh, at all in that western part. But I would hate to but, have us have some sort of a storm. I mean, with the kind of weather we've been having over the decades and have the creek overflow and houses be flooded. And uh, I, I would much rather err on the side of caution. Yeah, but we're, we're unlikely to have anything much worse than we did in 2015, where it certainly showed our vulnerabilities. Uh, the, you know, we, we're not on the Susquehanna River. You know, we are, we are at the headwaters of, of uh, multiple water sheds 
So there's a limit to how much flooding we can have. No but much of the rains. flooding that occurred wasn't the amount of water. It was the culverts being blocked by debris in the creeks that was floating down and getting jammed into the culverts. And I have pictures of my property. It came down from Jennifer Tiffany's property, jammed into the culvert on my creek, and it was like somebody had built a wall and the water just had no place to go but out on to my property, which probably never in thousands of years had been flooded like that. No, it's true. The culverts acted like dams all over town. Yep, which is a different issue completely than 100 foot buffers from streams. So maybe we could right. focus back on the Hamlet. And um, I do think that Rhonda brought up a good point that we do need to consider, which is how we deal with um, the habitat corridor and the stream uh, overlay. Those are both overlays that we've proposed. Um, and in the table that um, was shared and started being talked about at the last conservation group, there was a list of parameters that, um, that would apply to those. I think it does need to be fleshed out in relation to the Hamlet. Um, and I would personally suggest um, that it not be treated the same in the Hamlet as it's treated other places. Um, it, it doesn't always make sense to to have those kinds of regulations be the same in the part, the area that you're trying to grow as um, the rest of the area. And you can kind of make up for impacts in a small area by protecting more of the larger area. Um, but I do think that's something to think about and to come back to at a future meeting because we don't have anything prepared really to discuss about it um, for this meeting. Yeah. If you notice something, the, um, the wildlife corridor is in the most densely populated and built up part of the town. So the, to make a statement that, oh, we shouldn't build in those areas because wildlife won't use it just is not true. The, the facts are that wildlife is using and are using these areas that are the most developed within the town. So I really agree with you, David, because you just you look at the map, you look at where the corridor is, wildlife is using that corridor still, even though people have built there. We haven't blocked it. We haven't fragmented it to the point where it's not being used. It's very useful for animals. And I think we need to you know, take note of that. I think one of the things that we have to do is do some specific planning around the wildlife corridor or the slash creek for example, in uh, Trumansburg there, I think the creek that runs behind main, the Main Street stores is the beginnings of Taganic Creek. And along there, they have, uh, you know, a number of buildings and shops and things, but they have set those buildings and shops up high. Um, there is a place where you can stand and look into the creek and, and see the backs of the shops and things. And so I think we need to set that subject aside. I mean, the whole wildlife corridor through the hamlet ought to be discussed separately, how we're going to treat it and how we're going to regulate it or zone it or whatever. Yeah, we could do things like, you know, keep people from building fences across it that would block wildlife from traveling on it and, you know, requiring a vegetated uh, you know, some shading for the creek so that people don't clear their lawn all the way down to the water, um, that kind of stuff. That, that I think getting the DEC that is, that involved would be helpful so that we have recommendations from them and may, we might even be able to apply for a grant to do some sort of work on the creek to make it uh, even better. Yeah, could be. Would it, would it make but, sense yeah, but, I, but I endorse uh, by David's principle that, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't necessarily have the same buffering standard, you know, in the hamlet as we do outside of the hamlet. I think I'll just make it easier for the planning board in the future if, if we have some kind of guideline to follow rather than. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Just, to get there. just to share the start that was shared last week, if any, for people who weren't at that meeting, um, the, the proposed 
so far proposed requirements are fairly simple for 100 feet from perennial streams. It's no new impervious surface outside of the hamlet zones. So there it's already treated differently in the hamlet. Um, uh, waiver from planning board possible for trails and the shortest feasible crossing for roads and driveways if necessary within the 100 feet. Within 50 feet of intermittent streams at site plan review for any new impervious surface with a goal of minimizing and mitigating impervious surface to the greatest extent possible. For the habitat corridor at site plan review for any new impervious surface, the, the same, the goal of minimizing or mitigating to the greatest extent possible. Um, and then we have the aquifer high vulnerability zone as well. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the start on those, um, and those can those don't um, make it impossible to develop in the hamlet, um, especially treating the the hundred foot differently, um, and you know really just having it subject to additional review because it's an important area. But I also think we probably want to clean up those boundaries. You know they they came from a previous study that was done, um, as I've mentioned. In a few other occasions, you know, the the lines of shapes like this are usually drawn at a certain scale, you know, a certain zoom level, and a certain um, kind of scale of abstraction. And so, when you zoom all the way in on them, they don't always make um, sense all the way in. Um, right. They might make sense at a, the scale when you look at the whole town, but they might not make sense when you zoom into a particular parcel. Um, so I think that's that's worth putting some future thought into. But do we have any other thoughts about the extent of the two zones now? And if not, do we want to start talking about the draft regulations that you started reviewing last? That, that one, that one uh, pink or purple, what do you call it, spot on on on, uh, on Bald Hill Road? It's just between the two there. I kind of wonder about that particular property. I have to put the tip in this one? Yeah. By the way, that's two different lots. The yeah. top rectangular pink belongs to the other one to the right of the other pink. It's owned by Gerard and Lois. It's the White House that looks very colonial and they bought 10 acres from um, the Inman's back before we bought that piece of property. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you have, you have two colored the same that look like the same ownership, but it's not. It's owned by the Zen Buddhist Center, that, that lower pink one, the south pink one. Uh, which south pink one? The one so that's right in the cursor, right there, that one. That one? That, those two buildings are Zen Buddhist house uh, owned by David and Marcia. Yeah. Why would you have that be pink? Yeah, considering who they are, maybe that should join the rest of the Zen Center. Well, uh, that, that was the other alternative. Um, yeah, and the same with the, the pink above, that's a horse pasture. Right. I don't know why that's pink. How, how did well, it end up pink in the first place? Um, well, but then you're going to have the same feeling about pink just about every place. I'd rather it wasn't there. But, I mean, if uh, you, go on, you, you go on up Ball Hill Road, but we'll get, again, we're off topic. It's a subject for next, for next week, really. Uh, I don't have any issues with changing this to the rural two. Does anyone else have any concerns with that? Uh, rural two would be which color? The the, the square or squares. Or... The squares. Yeah. Well, as I had said um, a long time ago, Rick Dietrich had suggested that there be a path through there from the community park, you have to envision this, a community park across the road, across 96B, then th through, and we're just talking about a path, yeah. uh, through the, the open areas there and coming out right about there to Jennings Pond. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that looks fine to me and that would still, preserve. I mean, you can see how you can go from the dark green of the community park and make kind of a 
semicircle all the way to the driveway to the to Jennings Pond. Huh. There, there was talk about trying to get a trail behind the houses, houses on Bald Hill on the, the southern part of um, right running from the you know, pond behind over those to houses, the... not not the northern side of Bald Hill. No, I had suggested the ones behind the houses. I did. But Rick said, yeah, on, on the southern side of Bald Hill, Hill. not because on the northern side. Well, on, on the house side, the side where all the houses are, I had suggested that. And Rick said, well, why it's don't we go to the side. other fields? Okay, never what mind. are those brown lines, David? Never mind. There, this is a shape that I found in the planners, GIS shape files of potential trail routes. Uh -huh. and I don't what, know what when it was Ronda created. Was it, was, That's what, interesting. Was Ronda described something like this? I think it's similar to what. It's more like that, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. But what, what was in the uh, what was in the Hamlet revitalization plan was uh, was it was uh, as Leslie just described on the south east side of Bald Hill Road. It went from the pond basically to the center and across to the park. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, the there's people, no reason why you can't do both. No, this is true. No. Right. Except the really reason nice we didn't do either of them. It'd be a nice circular walk. Yep. The reason we didn't do either is because the residents there weren't keen. Right. right. Well, they go right through their properties. Well, they might change their mind at some time. They might. Um, you know, the paths and trails are becoming much more accepted as being amenities and not something to be avoided. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a zoning connection here? Um, well, I mean, we we might want to think about what is a, a network of trails within the Hamlet zone as something that would be. Is that, uh, we might want to think about a network of roads too, for that matter, uh, in in terms of plotting something for the future. So I that, think Jason had originally talked about the fact that we needed trails in the hamlet and connectivity, that whole thing. Right. Um, and, you know, if we go back quite a ways, I mean, a lot of the plans have talked in terms of, um, of putting, you know, future rights of way on the map so that people don't build something in the middle of something which is, you know, ultimately it's desirable to have it be a road. Yeah. That it that is relevant to zoning but that's a risk that's a restriction that how do you david how do you put something like that into a restriction just an overlay and no build overlay no the the town could adopt a future roads map uh, mm -hmm. that would be considered in subdivision oh. um whenever someone who had a lot that a future road went through wanted to do something that that would be included in the review. Hmm. Um, but I, I, See. I don't think we need to settle it to make some progress tonight on review of what we have so far. David? I don't... What do you see? Maybe I'll see. Go ahead, Liz. I have, I, and maybe, maybe this belongs in the next Friday's meeting, but there were two properties that were zoned commercial that I, I'd like to make sure that we somehow keep keep that in some way. <laughs> and I know we don't have commercial, but but and that's the the auto salvage warehouse two plus acres on Hornbrook Road and the um, what used to be PDZ four on 96B, um, I think it's seven acres. Um, th those people. That was, still, hmm? that was still PDZ, isn't it? No, is that, I thought that, it was, uh, but it wasn't, it was commercial A. They changed it to commercial. Why do you want to keep the parcel on Hornbrook Road? Well, because he, because th that PDZ was gotten rid of, it was defunct. Um, and they came and got it, got it changed to commercial because there's a warehouse there. 
Um, you know, what are you going to do, yeah. put apartments in there? I don't, you know, so they got the warehouse property. It's just a little over two acres um, zoned commercial so that somebody could use it as a warehouse. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I, I hate to lose that in all of this. It's the only two that I could really think of. Um, That's a good point, Leslie. Thank you. Yeah. I know it's, so it's this sort is the of the right meeting. Well, I don't know. It's in the low density. But that, you're talking about commerce. Yeah. Well, we haven't. We haven't. Um, what, what we've got in the, in the in the in the zone regulations here is some is provision for commercial throughout, really, uh, but especially right. in the orange area. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, and it's not precluded anywhere altogether. I don't. Yeah. Um, but I, I, these people. But the yeah. scale of it. I'm just, now, the scale of what's allowed on that property, though, is probably greater than what is allowed in the in the in the pale orange. Neither of those properties are community. in the pale. I don't think that. Well, the one might be. Well, if it might be but, this. Well, one. if if Ted's right about making that one aqua, uh, you know, surrounded by aqua, then it is in the pale orange. But well. what's that? That's two. Oh, that's the, that's, that's the, auto salvage. That's, that's the house. Two, that's auto no, salvage. that's the house. That, that um, it's it? to the left or to the right of that is that's the warehouse, right? Yeah, but it didn't, it didn't include the whole property though, right? Okay. Well, I remember that it was two and a half highway. acres or something. Where's the highway driveway? Where's the highway driveway? The green stripe uh, between to, them. It, it's too small to see. It, it's to, to the left of the uh, of the rectangle, you know, the, the one you outlined in, in aqua. Right, earlier. and the one that's out. So the out, one that's outlined is where the house is. It's going to be torn down. Right. And so right. it's the next property with the warehouse. It's just two acres. He split off. Right. It's not. It's not the whole right, property right. as it's indicated on this map. Right. It's this parcel. Huh. It's it's the. The, um, I'm not sure if the barn was included in that. I know I the mean, warehouse was. Yes, I don't remember. I'd have to get the map out. I'd have to get the map out. But I know at least the building on the right, the easternmost building, is definitely the warehouse. So. Um, yeah. And it would have been nice if Brian Moore had taken over that property instead of built his pole barn. Who? Brian, Brian Miller. <laughs> well, maybe they'll look into it. Somebody else will have that pole barn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. It's a it's yeah. it's basically commercial. It is too bad. Point. Yeah, it it is but, too bad. but but it yeah. was only commercial warehouses, I think is what it was allowed was was zone four. He wanted to warehouse for storage. Well, but when somebody up. comes to a planner and says, well, I'm thinking of building a pole barn on my property because I have an electric company and I want to store all my electric stuff in it and it's next to a house, uh, would be would have been nice if, uh, if somebody had thought of recommending to Brian that he consider this warehouse. Yeah. It seems like that we're off time, nice. folks. We're out of yeah, the ham. Nice. Why are we talking about yeah. this? Yeah, it's okay. not part of the commercial. Anyway, yeah, I think that was it. I think that was a good point that there are probably a few other commercial spots that we should check <laughs> out, and that there probably needs to be a zone for them that's not one of the zones that we've discussed, um, because we yeah. really were only supposed to be replacing the Hamlet zoning and the LDR. Um, right. And there, but there, there's, but there are, there are commercial zones as well. <laughs> yeah, there are a few spots where those don't overlap. Right. Um, a lot of the commercial zoning is in the Hamlet and will be replaced by the Hamlet. Zone. Right. So I, th I think that's a worthwhile point and I'll dig into that for the next map. Um, to see where, make sure that we capture all of those, kind of like we've captured the existing planned development zones. Um, we also have, and it's worth remarking, a, a, an area zone for uh, adult entertainment. Oh, yeah, where? <laughs> it's in your backyard. Your backyard, Joel, right? <laughs> then the, so we already the, have adult entertainment? <laughs> we had to have it, and so we it's put it in. Commercial 
It's in the commercial C zone. Yeah. Uh, I think it, I don't think it's the whole commercial C. I think it's just a back part of it. I'm pretty sure that's one of the allowed uses in commercial C. Okay. It was my understanding, with our understanding, that we had to have some area in town that allowed it. Yeah. We do. Yep. Is that still true? That's still true, yes. By the way, I was going to suggest that the town discuss at a town board meeting the sale of um, hemp and hemp products and where, where, if at all, it wanted to allow the sale of hemp and hemp products in the hamlet. Yeah, well, we have already talked to the point of saying like most of the towns around that we probably don't want to prohibit it. Perhaps they could put something on Howland Road. <laughs> No, <laughs> but um, well, we might want to allow it. To, well, so anyway, if, if we if we're going to supersede like most of commercial C because it's within the Hamlet, uh, you know, salmon colored area, uh, we would have to make sure that we are allowing the things that are allowed in C that we'd have to have some provision for. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Would that be a good reason to have yet one more special color? For that purpose, you don't Maybe. want to yeah. turn the whole the whole hamlet into an adult entertainment zone, right? And um, and and also while we're on the topic, the, uh, the at the last agricultural group gathering, there's another one tomorrow morning, by the way, if anybody wants to come at eleven at the park. Uh, the the area um, basically what was across the street from from Eco Village there that 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 was the Dobson property. That whole area was was seen as a potential area for. Uh, for processing facilities for agricultural activities, uh, you know, commercial on a, on a somewhat bigger scale, which could include something like the, you know, the hemp processing facility, but it could also include processing facility for like, a, um, for for tree nuts or, or for um, fabric, you know, um, you know, working with raw wool, converting it into um, yarn or whatever. Sounds um, like a bad thing to have right in the middle of the hamlet. Well, it's not in the middle of Hamlet. That's the point. Um, it's in the Hamlet. It's in the salmon-colored area. It's outside of the core, and it might be perfectly compatible um, with with uh, you know you know the, the kind of agricultural activity. It might be first of all, it's on the main road. Not a bad thing. Uh, and uh, and the area is less developed there, and you know accommodating that kind of somewhat larger scale we're not talking about you know building factories but we are talking about allowing for um well the kind of the kind of commercial uh light industrial i guess what you call sounds it sounds like you're talking about giovanni or some place like that i mean yogurt production uh that would be way bigger than anything we had in mind <laughs> well but it's still processing yeah, any kind of food processing so is making yogurt in your kitchen, you know. <laughs> well, but it is food. All you know, so food processing to, is it's a matter of scale. Would you be able to protect against um, uh, odors, pollu odor pollution in beautiful downtown Danby if you had that kind of processing facility? I don't know. I mean, could you? Can Might not be a great place. You, could you? Are you concerned like about odor production from? from allowed agricultural activities also in the hamlet? Because that's traditionally things like that happen. That, that would be probably, if it's not a year round production facility, it might be somewhat uh, limited problem. But if, you, if you're actually gonna encourage a, pro a production area in downtown Danby, that should be thought about before you go ahead. Yeah. I really think that the, the residents of the Hamlet should be consulted on those sorts of things and get their opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I got to chime in on what Joel said. If it, in candor, it was unbearable before uh, before um, Eamon put in that uh, digester, the, the, the level of stench from the manure. And it wasn't just during the time that he was spreading because he had uh, a small CAFO, uh, maybe it was a medium sized CAFO, and uh, produced enough manure that he had to have lagoons. So that, that kind of ag is the kind of ag that, that could smell year round. And that's really what Joel's asking about. 
It's, it's, it's part of what Joel's asking about. Jeff is asking about, yeah. Anyway, we do have, I mean, the, what, what a relic of our old zoning ordinance has been here for a long time is, you know, the, there's a provision that says, you know, manure, manure uh, storage can't be within 100 feet of property boundary. <laughs> that's that's very generous, but I think this the smell um, spreads a little further. Unbelievable. I think I will have uh, try, try a mile. <laughs> Half a mile at least. <laughs> I I'm would just saying, really, <laughs> uh, well, I say relic, yeah. you know, I mean, when, 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 when that provision was written, uh, probably the average dairy was, you know, between 25 and 50 cows. Right. You didn't have KFOs. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. It and should be in the ag that, that that's really, really want to have it somewhere. That's what it should say. Yeah. Anyway, David, uh, you had several things you wanted to accomplish. Could you give us an idea where we're? Where we what we should be focusing on? Yeah. Uh, so at the last the last time we met, I walked everyone through um, two zones and a set of parameters um, for those zones. Um, before this meeting, I shared some questions that Olivia had and my answers to her. Um, and I, I'm not sure if people have read that or if it's useful to look at that again or if. We should just move forward with um, comments and concerns people had after reading through um, those two zones uh, so that we can decide how to move forward, how close we are with them, what kinds of things need to change. Um, um, could you, did, did everybody see Olivia's and, and David's response? I, I did. Yeah, I read it. it. It was in the doc file that was in the email. It, it was a uh, like a word doc and it had the little you know, bubbles, the Somebody little bubbles along the side of the page and you clicked on the bubble and it was the discussion. There's really not a lot of comments, um, so it wouldn't be terribly hard to go through them. Um, but I know yeah. Ted had uh, emailed me about a dozen times, had some back and forth. Um, so Ted, maybe you have some things you want to share with the group. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a step back to our very first meeting uh, with Jason when he asked us all to sort of give a nutshell of why we were attending the Hamlet meeting. Mm -hmm. And I hope I remember. I'm remembering correctly, but. I, th I think I was saying, look, I don't actually live in the Hamlet, so I'm just interested in what goes on. I'd like to, you know, offer opinions if I see something good or something bad. I sure would like to make sure that the Hamlet doesn't extend itself out too far, because then it would be affecting me. Um, and what I saw, I I'm speaking in very global terms. I saw some good things in, in what I read there. Uh, one of the biggest problems I think we've got in the Hamlet area is the fact that the um, Department of Transportation created this super wide boulevard. And although my first reaction to the 10 foot uh, front setbacks was, wow, that's small. I, I thought about it some more. I said, you know, maybe that will help create more of a narrow corridor that will help slow things down and create a Hamlet feeling. So I, I changed my mind on that. The other major takeaway I had from it, um, there were some minor ones, but the other major one is probably not something that um, David intended, but in the document uh, which had these six uh, example pictures to compare Hamlet sizes, um, I, I don't think this was intentional, but the two urban areas that were circled at the bottom, Trumansburg Main Street. I don't want, you know, I shouldn't say I don't want. I, I think it would be disappointing to see our hamlet turn into something like downtown Trumansburg, and especially not downtown Ithaca Commons. So I think that those were inadvertent, but I just I hate to see a, a vertical corridor, you know, even a two story high corridor down for several hundred feet. I just don't think it would look really great. Uh, Brooktondale is better there there's but Brookendale looks to me like there's more space between houses than what i'm reading in here um th th those those were the two major things that, that 
I think the 10 foot isn't so bad, 10 foot road setback. Um, but I do find some concern about ending up with a, uh, somehow my, my mind gets this picture of um, Dryden Road between Eddy and um, College Avenues, which used to be private houses and is now a vertical, vertical gorge. Well, yeah, but that, consider its location. I mean, the probability that anything like that's going to happen to Danby. Well, everything, everything in its own scale. I think if you ended up with two-story buildings on either side of the road, which would be a much smaller scale, uh, but I'm not sure. I would. I'm not sure I want to see that happen. It doesn't affect me much. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna scream about it. I'm just saying. I don't think I'd want to see it happen. Yeah, I, I, I personally, I don't think I would have any problem with that. I think it would look more like downtown Newfield if we did. Even downtown Newfield with no virtually space in some areas between houses uh, is, is a version of that same scenario. But downtown not, Newfield yes. doesn't have a highway running through the middle of it. No, that, and the highway that is a big problem. I mean, you know, the, the, that's a hundred foot right away for the state highway. Which is uh, a, 66, I think. Nope, I think it's wider than that. I think it's 100 feet. Well, then the phone pole, telephone poles and power poles are inside the right of way because they're, they're on a 33 foot standard. David, do you know what the. I don't know how accurate the county's shape files are, but if you were to go by them, it would be about 75. Um, but that doesn't mean anything. That probably doesn't count the ditches, I think. I, I think it goes to the backside oh. of the ditches, actually. You know, it, the, um, un, unlike the other roads, which county road and town road, they're user roads, the state highway is, um, the state claimed ownership of the right of way to a fixed width um, some time ago. And uh, they are, you know, they, they're very um, I say aggressive, you know, they, 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 they don't have to justify, uh, you know, some portion of what they're doing as being in the right of way or not. Um, it is a fixed width. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, for what it's worth, at the top of the picture that's now visible, um, I went, I, when I moved the uh, community council sign over to the to the property next to the park, uh, Paul Hansen and I did the measurement and I designed it, you know, it was placed so as to be just outside the state's 33 foot boundary. And a little bit further north from that, you start seeing uh, the telephone poles, which are also at about the same distance. Mm -hmm. could, could, just a thought, I, I kind of thought the idea was that we would have a hamlet, which did include some small businesses and that height of buildings was not the major issue. Ha I mean, of course, we it is somewhat limited already. But one of the things that does yep. happen if you do have um, a street front similar to something that's going on in Trumansburg, which I don't think is offensive, but you do have a possible possibility of some affordable housing um, for <laughs> shopkeepers and such that might be Nice. Now, if we're if we're going to say we can't have this and we can't have that, then I guess we don't have a Hamlet. The maybe what we are looking for is some kind of compromise. It's it's you know, and it's not whether one of us does or doesn't like it. I maybe the, that definition of why do we want a Hamlet in the first place needs to be revisited if if we're going to say naysaying things. Any thoughts on that? No. Yeah. 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 And here's Lane. I've had, some, I was thinking about something like this along that line today. Um, I drive between, drive, I drive through Dryden to Cortland quite a bit. I have for over 22 years because I own property over there. And I've seen a lot of changes in Dryden and Cortland. And there's so many businesses that we used to be there thriving that are empty and vacant. It's really disheartening. Mm -hmm. And I think about what we're trying to do we don't have a population center and it's a big ask. I mean, I'm really glad that we're talking about it. So I've been thinking about it and I thought, 
maybe what we really are wanting is a sense of community. And maybe it's not about the buildings. Maybe it's about trying to figure out how to create community. I mean, I really felt that when we went for that, went for that walk the other day, everyone was so happy to talk to each other and meet new people. And, and, and I know, know that this is the right venue to talk about that, but I just, I kind of wanted to put that thought out there. Like, is there some way we could use the town hall for bingo or game night or I don't know, just, you know, try to create more community and maybe the Hamlet would come out of that. The, uh, the sense of community wanting to build something, you know, I don't you know. know. It's, but, it's interesting. It's just my thoughts should, on that. Just want yeah. to share that. It's, it's interesting you should bring that up, Nancy, because it was, it was the impetus behind the creation of the West Danby Community Association. Um, because you know when we close when we when the post office closed we lost the point of connection uh, and and what what we've concluded over a long period of time uh, despite our best efforts is that uh, the the way people get to know each other and community develops is when they interact naturally in the course of their lives uh, and the, that used to be you know that because they they knew people through church they knew people through through uh, community associate, you know, you know, Grange Grange associations, or belong to the fire department, or they bumped into each other at the store or the post office, and over time you get to know each other, you had conversations, and you built community that way naturally. I'm trying to sort of create uh, opportunities for people to get to know each other. We fi have found does not work very well because. Uh, the people who already know each other come because they already know each other and the people who don't come because they don't know anybody. Mm. So it's really hard to build community that way. And it's much more likely <clears throat> if we can create opportunities for people to interact. You know, if we have, mm -hmm. and the park is a good, yeah. is, you know, is a good start, you know, um, recreational facilities, daycare, um, adult care even, uh, you know, uh, community you know, social groups and 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 even multi single purpose, uh, you know, clubs and so forth that, that that meet in shared spaces all promote, you know, a sense of real community. A school is really important, and we don't have one. But, um, I'm but always think, surprised at how many people are at the church on Sundays. So I don't know where they're from. You know, I don't know who many, uses the Danby Church, but <laughs> many of them are not from Danby. Maybe yeah, not that's, most, that's a no. problem. I mean, I we got that same situation here in West Danby too, where you know, you know, out of a congregation of two hundred or something, is like twenty-five people from West Danby. But um, well, that, Joe, the that's operative the word. Are the, I'm sorry to jump in here, but the operative word is care. You know, daycare, child care. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe we can start thinking about building something to help people. Help you know? There's so many dilapidated houses. Some kind of organization. I don't know. If people want help on their houses, but I mean, just something like you said, a, a purpose, something purposeful. I don't know. We we could probably have a lot of different ideas if we started all put our heads together and talk about that. You know, Olivia made a good point last time about uh, the kinds of businesses that we tend to have are home occupations or they grow from home occupations and it's much more likely that somebody's going to start something if they can start small you know run it out of their living room or dining room or garage um, and then uh, you know it turns into a business that's, that's then you know a point of uh, commerce in the, in the community and those are done on the whole unless, unless they're you know noisy or smelly um, assets to the community and Olivia's point was, you know, that kind of business is most apt to start in property that you own, you know, the, rather than you know, looking for a place to build a property, you know, to, to house a building, I mean, to house a business. Although if we had a commercial core of, of storefronts that could be rented, then, then, you know, that would give some businesses a place to rent if, you know, if, if they got to going to the point where they thought they would justify the expense of having a separate facility, I, you know, in, in so, light of how, how much retail has, has, has shrunk in the presence of online um, sales. Joel, um, the, the one place where I think that isn't true in, in areas like ours is uh, 
uh, produce. If you look at that CSA at the corner of Nelson, it's just one jog up from the school, Montessori School, Nelson yes. and State Highway. They almost look on a crowded day, and it's not just one day a week, like a market could be in there. So I'm sort of envisioning one of these small storefronts in the hamlet where someone would be bringing in produce and where someone would, you know, you can't build a post office, you can't build a school, but you can build a little Danby market again. And, yeah, you uh, could. And as in you fact, say, uh, it's something you have to start small. Yeah, and that was the fact that one of Olivia's um, visions, if you're part of Olivia's vision, was to use her barn as like a, like a, at least a summertime farmer's market. Yep. That the same thing yep. could be happening. We could, we could, we could um, pivot off of the church having church services on Sunday morning and have a farmer's market in the parking lot, you right. know, af after right. services, um, which would, you know, or, or you could connect it to the food pantry. Well, this is off topic, but uh, since it's been brought up, uh, Sarah Brown, who lives on Eastman Hill Road, uh, had talked to me about wanting to start a farmer's market. And I had pointed out to her that we had already had two that had failed. Right. But, you know, she is interested if we can get some other people interested and maybe Olivia's barn would be a nice place, uh, you know. Well, for what it's worth, uh, um, um, oh. Alana. 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 Alana, right. Alana, Alana has, has set that. up a, a, a monthly uh, trial balloons, if you will, um, uh, uh, at the park over the summer for uh, I think it's, I don't remember whether there's one in June. It's like June, July, August, and September, something like that. Some um, just things one, starting in late June. Late, late yeah, June. summertime. Um, where it, it, it try to do just a, a, a one, one time, once a month, I guess, um, gathering where it's it's produce sales, but it's also going to be a little bit of music and uh, you know a, a social event, uh, maybe a food truck or something to 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 see if we can't get something going where the community can come together. That the church, you may recall, um, had their uh, uh, Sundays on Wednesdays gathering on, uh -huh. the, on the front lawn, which was very that was that's been that's been very popular as a sort of a community um, huge gathering where they well they the really crowds. Trumansburg had I, I was in a group and we were looking at zoning stuff and wound up in Trumansburg and. It was a Wednesday evening, I think, and there's a spot just down from the post office, kind of where the road v, V's in two directions, and they have their uh, okay. village market there, and they have people playing music, and somebody was reading picture books to the kids, and and there were a number of people selling produce and things like that, and I thought it was a very nice event. So it's, it, it can be, a, and people were just gathering to sit around and they'd buy, there was a food truck, there really was a food truck there. And there were people standing in line at the food truck and there were seats for people to sit around and maybe, you know, something like that could be done. Yep. Um, so, you know, we have some precedent for doing some of these things and having them actually work as opposed to having the farmer's market that didn't work. But so I, I would say that, you know, but so the, the point is, though, relevant to what we're doing here in terms of planning, it, it was Olivia's point, too, is that what we're most likely to get by way of commercial development is not somebody putting up, you know, a big commercial building, um, but somebody doing something maybe collaboratively where we, we take advantage of, of an existing building. You know, imagine, for instance, uh, you know, the Rose, the Rose Barn being used for different purpose or Olivia's barn being used for that kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, and otherwise, uh, it's going to be people want to do it out of their garage or, or running it out, or running it in, you know, running a business out of their, you know, they got a, they got a room off on the side of the house or something. Uh, well, if, if that prediction is realistic, could we simplify what we're doing right now? Well, that's the question I'm raising, whether, whether it's, it, it's um, so there's, there's two things that, that, that one wants to weigh here, because on the one hand, um, having things close together and aggregated, they build off of each other. So multiple businesses located within walking distance of each other creates a, 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 a venue uh, and, they, and, they, and they benefit from each other's presence. 
if you spread them out over, a, a, then everybody has to drive to everything, and it's not really it's not really Hamlet-like. Uh, so 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 where's the compromise here? Because the uh, one could focus on trying to to build up that Hamlet core, which is what what our dark orange is about. Uh, and the, the question is, well, how realistic is it to do that? I don't know how realistic it is to do that, but but I think the um, the argument that we need to accommodate the alternative uh, to some degree uh, in order to to you know en enable business at all uh, needs to be taken into consideration. And I think that was why Olivia was arguing for you know a, a, a longer and more extended um, business area. Uh, Rather than having it so tightly focused on on on, on very small orange area, but um, can we have our cake and eat it too, um, David? Where we would have uh, enable the kind of denser um, stuff in the dark orange, but also accommodate uh, smaller scale. Um, well, we already it's it's in your it's in the rules, and we could go over them. Um, you know, home occupations as we've known them. But if but it need not be limited to home occupations. Uh, I was kind of curious myself about the professional offices being under the accessory uses versus under the permitted uses. Because I, th I think that's kind of what you're talking about. But yes, it is because uh, I mean, home occupations are basically accessory uses. Uh, not according to the IRS. I mean, as a writer. I, I'm sitting here in my totally office. different. It's totally different. Let's not get off topic there. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kelly brings up uh, the actual zoning. So thank you, Kelly. Um, <laughs> and Kelly, were you talking about the uh, that letter G that you just pat no, up at the next, the one above that? Great. The so offices. So that that's professional offices that are accessory to a residence. Um, right. Basically, this is an expansion of the town's home current um, home-based business, which doesn't allow as many employees, but allows more kinds of work. Right. Um, so that that is still. Uh, but do see. we have other access, other professional offices that aren't home based that are also not retail? Which yes, should be under primary. So it's oh. under oh, yeah, there you go. permitted by yep. site plan approval. Site plan approval. Right, right. Yeah. Which I guess because that was one that I thought was a little bit more in line with developing. I mean, if you think of like a, like a lawyer's office or um, an attorney's office, like that is something that people could go drive their car to and park and then want to walk to the grocery store next door if we're trying to develop the Hamlet. Yeah. Um, I don't so know. That, it, it's an attractor to other things that would be in the area if you're trying to create development. Yeah. So I think currently that use is under uses requiring site plan approval. Um, and it, I think it, this actually gets to Olivia's first question um, on this, which was about, oh, we only have these two, two permitted uses. And so if I can remind everyone, there's kind of three categories here. There's permitted uses, there's permitted accessory uses, and then permitted uses by site plan approval. Um, so for example, in the Hamlet Center Zone, where we've started with retail use up to 2,000 square feet, that means someone who wants to do that, they want to open something really small, permitted uses don't require site plan approval. They go to the building department and ask for a building permit and they build it. Um, this longer list of uses permitted by site plan approval, they're still allowed, they're just allowed and require site plan approval by the planning board, which means the planning board's going to look at the design of the site, how it reacts to the neighboring sites, um, how much parking there is, how the access is provided, um, all of those kinds of things. And 
um, can ask the developer to change those things um, and can require the developer to change those things before they allow it. But all of these things are allowed. Um, is, this in the, is this just in the dark orange, David, or does this mm -hmm. include the light orange? This is just the dark orange. Yeah, so that's, that's the, I think, where Olivia has the issue and, and where what I had to say um, you know, comes into play uh, is that um, we may need more flexibility to do to that outside of the dark, but along the, along the corridor. Um, Within the dark area, the, um, the alphabet soup, except for the last two, none of them mention any limits on size. Is that intentional? Some of them, some of those could be quite large. Um, they could, and I think the the reason for a limit on size on those two is the kinds of things that people expressed interest in definitely not having. Right. Um, and I mm. don't think that's as much of an issue with the other uses. Um, well, and anything else, I mean, anything in here is has to go through site plan approval right. anyway, so you could limit the size of it in that process. Could you yeah, limit right. the size without standard? Well, that's a good point. I don't think you could, could you that's do right. that? That's true. It I just, mean, says it, it, it just says library. I mean, <laughs> you could have, you could fill up all of downtown with a library. Good Low probability. Pretty big library. Low probability event. Um, right. no, I, one I, day I I'm going to get rid of my books. <laughs> oh no! Well, if 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 someday you want to build the you know the, the Crane Memorial Library, that's okay with me. <laughs> oh, all of that. All one of that bowling fiction. alley. <laughs> one bowling alley will do will do in <laughs> both sides of, of downtown. One Remember we. Remember, we were showing that uh, just the dark orange area is the size of the entire Ithaca Commons. So whenever we start to feel like, oh, there's not a whole lot of room there, there is a whole lot of room there. We're just not used to thinking about it that way. That, that is kind of the purpose of that exercise that we did on the walk on Wednesday and that I shared um, with other people. It's not to say that, um, that that is the goal to develop at that level. It's to understand the scale, that that's how much space we have. Um, so that's whenever we talk about what can and can't fit, it could fit within the two blocks that create the other commons, then it can fit in DMB. I think though that having a sidewalk where people could walk along there would help people to identify the scale better. They would understand sure. I, but they're I just driving by i think everybody in the that's that a great one. thing to talk about when we're done with the zoning um so maybe we can come back to um things that people found in the zoning document that they they had questions about um and if people don't have specific things i can go through olivia's things and read you her questions and answers if that's you want you want to you want to start at the top and work your way down because then sure. uh, I could sort of jog my memory on what it was that i had questions about so um the we have in this document there's two zones there's the hamlet center and the hamlet neighborhood um the hamlet center starts with a purpose uh, there's no minimum lot size in the Hamlet Center zone, except that subdivisions have to be approved by the health department. Um, the first question Olivia had was there's two permitted uses. Um, this is uses permitted without further site plan review or approval. One to four unit residents with customary accessory structures and retail use provided that the establishment does not exceed 2000 gross square feet in floor area with the exception of basement storage areas and provided there's no drive-through window or design and design guidelines are followed because we do have design guidelines for the Hamlet already. Right. Um, Olivia said, what if someone wanted to have a space that's carved into small nooks with movable dividers for co-working or artistic activities? Also on the drive-throughs, yes, we don't want Burger King, but a bakery or cafe might want to be able to reach customers with the convenience of a drive-through. It's all about design, car flow, size, et cetera. 
Uh, my Why don't we want drive throughs Who's that? Why don't we want drive throughs uh, So that's, I think, been um, one of the clearer things that I've heard from people is that the Hamlet should be a uh, human scale focused place that is focused on um, a future with more walking and biking and drive throughs are very dangerous um, for creating that and also um, cut up the street frontage in a way that makes it difficult to build out a walkable place. So I think this is unrealistic to make it walkable. The um, it, Danby is a place you drive through, not a place you walk to or walk along 96B. The number of people who are within your half mile radius or, um, is a few hundred people within that radius and half of them can't walk a mile. So um, I think- But we're talking about a long range plan. I, right, right. You know, West Danby is smaller than Danby by far. And yet um, it's quite walkable. And I think you could mess it up pretty good if you did a drive through. Well, I, huh. whether it, yeah, you know, people aren't going to walk to, um, most of the people in Danby live outside of walking distance to the hamlet. So if any business is going to be viable, they have to deal with people driving there. Yeah, but not necessarily driving through. But one yeah. of the points is if what's, you can what's drive the difference to one between place... driving through and driving into a parking lot? Oh, what, what you what we can hear... drive to one place, you can drive to that place and then walk to others, as opposed to having to drive and drive and drive to various places. That assumes you have that a critical good. mass of places. And with yes, the, yes, that, you're that's exactly Danby, right. It's... You're not going to turn Danby into down Dryden. That's and what the zoning is. Dryden equal... is dying anyway. So, um, the only viable part of Dryden is the part going north where the, um, where the grocery store and the pharmacy are. Um, so I, I think it's unrealistic to expect you're going to grow a cluster of little, little buildings that people are going to come to as a destination rather than. But that's exactly what we're trying to do. I mean, that, that's exactly what we've been working on for the last four or five months it's exactly what we have in mind and we, we've sort of the consensus has been that that would be there are a whole lot of differences of opinion on size and 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 style and so forth but the consensus has been that we really are trying at least 25 30 40 years from now to create something that is that kind of uh, a community with storefronts and with points of interest where people would want to come and then park and then walk and and uh what we're trying to do now is design zoning or actually look at zoning that's been been designed that would that would facilitate or invite that. It is the plan. Yeah, I, do you I, survey I, most of the people in Danby, they want a convenience store where they can buy gas, beer, and bread. And uh, that might that's not true. That, anything that, less than that's that. not and true. If you surveyed Bring, bring me back that survey. I mean, I, I know that the circle I have of friends here in, in the 20 years we've lived here is fairly large and there isn't a single person I know, and I mean large number of people uh, who, who wants a, a, a dandy mark in the middle of Danby. And, and in fact, we've had, you know, discussions and discussions and discussions. We've really had a lot of room for people with points that are as widely varying as Rhonda's and, and, and uh, Joel's, for instance. They sometimes are on opposite ends of the spectrum on conservation or, or uh, Russ and me. But we still are all revolving around a plan, which in the end really is geared toward some kind of walkable uh, hamlet. Where, where there are little storefronts. Exactly what you're saying nobody wants is, is what we've, we've well, heard, at least in these groups. Many, there many There hasn't been any work. development to that extent in the last 30 years. And it's, part of the reason has been that exactly. the zoning has not exactly. been designed for that. There, we are working on it now. Is, uh, people could have done it if it was economically viable. Yeah. I think maybe there I, I, is I think a compromise. <laughs> maybe there's a bit of a compromise because the I, um, you know, when you want to attract people, you can't think that everybody that you're going to attract is able to walk everywhere. It's 
pilot, there are maybe the idea of a drive through has a bad connotation only because we are thinking specifically of McDonald's or something. Um, there could be other things. For instance, it's very convenient to be able to drive up to the pharmacy window sometimes. We haven't even talked about a pharmacy extension. Um, and I thought it would be nice to, it's some things we can't have in, in terms of a store, but we might be able to have a Chinese carry out, something that doesn't have a, the requirements of a dining room. So, I mean, Coffee expanding connection. our ideas a little bit is Coffee something, yeah. it could be a little threatening, a coffee shop. You know, people do go to the drive up window of a coffee shop sometime. And indeed, that does not mean that people necessarily will talk, but it does, it's just compromise. And Lynn, the idea of the future is, is a big part of our push, but the idea of the present, your, your thoughts are important for that too. You know, we, 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 have, we have opportunity here to work together to expand what we've thought is okay, reject what, you know, we, we have our manager together. It's, it's a good thing. You know, I, thinking about the, uh, the drive-throughs, the, the one thing that, I, that, that characterizes them is that you're not interacting with anybody. And if we're talking about, you know, right. creating opportunities for people to get to know each other, the, 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 the antithesis of that is driving up to a place and opening your window and getting your, what you want and driving away. Um, what does that get you? Um, you know, no, you have no, to at least Joel, park, no, go in the store. Joel, it could be that you drive up to the place, get what you want, and go to the park and sit together and eat it. Yeah, a coffee shop or even like an ice cream shop are probably two of the best ways to attract people to a particular property and to get people together. Yeah, and we used to have that with the with this with the store at one point. It was very popular too. So at least I don't, not economically viable. Well, yeah. it was. I th it was it was, was economically, economically viable and still be there. No, yeah, it was only it, economically viable when it was a family running no, the place. No, no, as you had employees, no. it got more difficult. Yeah, it was not. Hey, Katie viable. had had enough. Katie didn't want to do it anymore. Yes. Well, um, yeah, I mean, they well, lost a person. I, I know Katie pretty well, and uh, she was just fed up with it. Yeah. Why was she fed up? About, Again, if it was well, economically yeah, viable, wait, somebody wait, wait, else wait. would have taken it over. You guys, that store, yeah, let me tell you, I renovated that business. store. I renovated that store. It was beyond painting. It was beyond, it was in such bad shape. Mm -hmm. It was so, it was such a, a heat loss. She couldn't even afford to heat it. I mean, there's many reasons why the store didn't work, but the building itself was, in, it was decrepit, honestly. Mm -hmm. So Let's keep that in mind before we decide why Katie stayed in business or why she didn't. That's a very complicated conversation. Right. And I think going back to the, the concept of why not have site plan review with the drive through and it might be okay, you know, no, like we, if we are trying to set something up for the future, then make it a possibility. You don't have to say yes or no right now, because we don't know what it's going to be like in 30 years. You're right. Maybe so that's all I'm saying. You're right, Nancy. Yeah, a, a question for David. A drive-through implies two driveways, in and out. Yep. How does that, uh, how does, is that congruent with the size of the lots that the, um, the when we, we aren't down to the numbers section really yet, but is that congruent with the size of lots you're imagining? You're talking about 30 foot worth of driveway. There's no, there's no minimum um, lot size in the Hamlet. That's correct. How much Hamlet do we so, have? I, mean, I, I actually, you know, I actually think that the no driveway, uh, no drive through restriction uh, helps us. It, it allows us to have, a, you know, we don't have paved uh, driveways in and out with arrows on them in downtown Danvers. It may not happen today, it won't happen today, but one day, we don't want to use it up on that stuff. Can I offer another uh, opinion about a drive-through? Yeah. Yeah, before the, before, before you do, I'd kind of like to let Colleen have a word oh, here. Oh, I'm because sorry. Been... I just want to say something about drive-through. Yeah. So Colleen, I just, go ahead. This was 
there was so much conversation. I had a point I wanted to make a while back about things being viable or feasible at this point. Yeah, I think it doesn't really matter today what's viable or feasible, but part of the whole reason the moratorium happened is because we know that sprawl is happening. We know that Ithaca is inching out towards DMB and we wanted to put a pause on it so that we could be prepared. This is happening all over the country where people are sprawling. And so I think let's keep our minds open to what possibilities are and prepare for them. Um, also just for the drive through it says right underneath Olivia's notes that it's possible, it just needs to be reviewed. So that feels like a not so important to know what, what we decide if we can review case by case. Also, last thing, I would love to open a coffee shop downtown at some point, but we do have water issues. Like businesses that do yes. food and stuff like that need a lot yeah. of water. So yep. it's something a long term, just I would love for that to work somehow. <laughs> yep. Yep. Water it's and wastewater are both key. Yeah. To you know development constraints. There's a lot of water in the downtown area because in the bottom of the valleys is where the majority of your water is. So I think you'd have lots of water as long as you have a site big enough with a well. I would think and so, but I, I did just saw a house on DMB Road, just 1926, so not terribly, still close enough to the hamlet that needs a second well. So I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not possible, but you know, ag and market comes out if you own a business and your water needs to be really good and healthy. And then you also need to do a lot of dishes and a lot of cleaning. And it's just, there's just a lot of water involved with uh, coffee, particularly. But yeah, yeah, my husband and I would love to have a downtown cafe. Day. Excellent. Thanks, yeah. Colleen. Nancy has her hand up. Nancy, you're muted. 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 What? You're good. Whoops, no, you just now muted. you're muted. Uh-oh, you muted yourself again. I think it doesn't work on my picture. I have to go down to the, the dock to unmute successfully. I'm sorry about yeah. that. So we own a building right now that has a drive through It doesn't have a drive through but it, up in Lansing, we own the old Pizza Hut building. We've been trying to sell it. And the two parties that are interested in buying it right now both want it because it has the ability to have a drive through one is, um, I can't really say what they are, but they're not food oriented. Um, hmm. And it's the only building, the only property in Lansing right now that is allowed to have a drive through. And both of these businesses want to have a drive through. So I don't really think we need to preclude drive throughs. We just have to have site plan review for a drive through because it could bring something here, you know, like we just don't know. That's all. I, a bank branch. For instance, something. a bank. Yeah. Yeah. A yeah. drugstore. I mean, um, I know what you're saying, Joel, that it doesn't promote, doesn't necessarily promote um, the kind of community because people stop by, but that's just, you can't deny that, especially after COVID, that this is going to, it's not going to go away. Drive through and food to take out and stuff. And oftentimes a place that has a drive-through also has a walk-in area too. You know, it's not just a drive-through yeah. unless you're looking at Coffee Mania in Cortland. And so we fix it so that it could be, you know, to have a drive-through, you also have to be able to, to walk up. Uh, there's a, so there's a variety of things that we can do between allowing the typical Dunkin' Donuts that has basically a building completely surrounded by roads and parking and mm -hmm. not allowing drive throughs at all, such as allowing drive throughs that are only accessed on the back of the building um, from a parking area and that don't encircle the building, requiring you know, a certain amount of the, the building to be on the street and only have drive aisle on one side. Um, there, there are some options if you wanted me to put together some stronger restrictions that would still allow drive-throughs. Um, we, that's certainly something that I could do. Um, it is a, a very small area that we have here. So, um, you know, you can really, 
when you open the door to drive throughs you then can't say no to something for having a drive through you can try to um, meld it but it it does put you in a more difficult spot but if that's something that everyone feels is important we can certainly allow drive throughs and then try to regulate them as much as we can is that something we could do in maybe the Hamlet neighborhood? My only issue is that I thought we were talking about the Hamlet core, like that, those areas are already so small to begin with mm -hmm. that anything involving some type of drive through just, it does inherently just take up a lot of space, right? Yeah. We just said the, uh, you know, compared the Hamlet to the Ithaca Commons and was commenting on how big it was. It's either small or it's big. But that's density. It's it's big in that it's dense. It's not big in that we want to take up one thing with like half of the, maybe like a quarter of the core area, which would yeah. be with with I mean, parking lot for the walk-in and the drive-through. It's a lot of space, but not a lot of density. Yeah, you could take up half of the Ithaca Commons with a typical dandy mart easily. Those are yeah, huge. Yeah, right then that would be kind of counterproductive. Yeah. It would be activity. Not a sonic. And it would draw sonic. people. <laughs> but that seems like it's something that would be more fitting for the Hamlet neighborhood section, not the Hamlet core, which we're trying to encourage density. Yeah, Sarah, I think that's a, it's an interesting point because currently the way the core and neighborhood are structured is that the neighborhood is more focused around residential and pretty strictly limits commercial. It does allow some commercial. And I think what I've, heard in the corners. People, <laughs> what, I've, what I've heard from people so far is that the limits were too much. Um, it almost makes me wonder if we actually want three zones. Makes me wonder the same thing, uh, particularly along the main highway where the kind of businesses what that take up more be? space uh, could be accommodated. The kind of you know, the drive-throughs, the uh, you know the nursery um, business, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, the bowling alley that was alluded to earlier. You know the the, the things that are 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 and, and and maybe even some of the the uh, light industrial uses could be um, accommodated because they need access to the highway or would want access to the highway if they're if they're traffic drawers or they generate traffic. So, yeah, that uh, makes sense going north and south out of town, I would be. Yeah. Hey, uh, a yes. thought too is, I agree with that. you know, if you design that people would come, let's say, to the park and actually park at the park, and then from that point access mm -hmm. a small walking hamlet, just like we have all yeah. probably gone to the Ithaca Commons and you park there in town and then you walk from your car and you walk through the commons. I mean, if we design that kind of a walking town, that would work with both us being spread out and it's not a walking town, but it can be coming as long as we have a place for parking. Yeah, yes. and, and then what you want the to access is behind. a walking distance. Yes, actually, uh, you may, I think Russ made a great point, which is that you have to park somewhere, you know, you might go to a business and park behind it, but having a centralized parking area, which we sort of do with between park and town hall is a good thing. Right. That's, that's where they're walking from. We've got, we've got, See, Nancy has plays. We got, got her hand up waiting to talk, Nancy. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, are there, do you know if there's any restrictions on having a drive through um, on 96B? You know, like curb cut highway, and there's no yeah. stoplight there or anything like that. It may not even be allowed. New curb cuts would have to be approved by the state since it's a state highway. And they they might frown on it on the curve, but this is the straightaway part. They also might require you to not have a loop around the building, uh, kind of typical access because they usually want you to only to have the minimum number of access points possible so they might require you to go in and out at the same spot i mean ideally we want um you know we're thinking about thinking about olivia's parcels if you're to put those two parcels together and have a variety of things on them you only want one driveway that accesses the parking area for as many buildings as you have there 
Yeah. Um, it would be it would be impossible to de develop the kind of character we've been talking about if you for every building it has its own driveway. That's just not workable. But but doing a, a, a sort of mini mall, if you will, that, that like the ones you were um, showed last time around on Olivia's property, where you know parking would be in the central area, and then you have buildings in a U around it, where the barn is in the middle there with the with the potential for farmers market. She had talked at one point of having one of the buildings converted on the on the south side into a, a, a commercial space, and then the and then the having residential units on the on the on the north side, you know, filling in and augmenting what's already there. Um, that seems to me totally plausible. Yeah. So to, to bring us back to drive throughs. Um, so there, there's two, two things going on here. One is um, I don't think there's any way that a drive through should be allowed without site plan review. It sounds like some people are comfortable with uh, a drive through with a set of um, restrictions that makes it as minimally of a negative attribute as possible. Um, and I think that would be something that would go under uses permitted with site plan review. Um, does anyone think that we should just not allow drive throughs in the Hamlet core? I'm inclined that way, at least in West Danby. Um, I, I'm inclined that way as well. Inclined which way? To, to not have the drive-throughs in the core. Not have driveways. I, I would drive agree. Not in the core anyway. It's so already the boundaries are so small. I just feel like it would be counterproductive to allow something there that would defeat the purpose of the reason for the core. But yeah. I like the idea of a, of a, a third zone. Why couldn't it be for the uh, site plan review and then let the planning board decide? I mean, why? Uh, why they well, you can't say no in yeah. site plan review. You can only right. give conditions on it. That's the problem. Well, okay. Let's take, for instance, Olivia's property. There's plenty of room there for a drive-through. And we've actually seen them down in Queens where they use the same broken concrete egress and in ingress as uh, in and out, and they go right around the building. Well, I haven't said anything for a long time, but I will say this. I don't think it's appropriate to use Olivia's property for a single entity, such as a Dunkin' Donuts or a pharmacy or a bank. And anyway, most people are doing their banking online and pharmacies are now, um, you know, a person is now allowed to buy their um their medicines uh, online mail order. and everything. Yeah, mail so order. It's yeah, so it may not be a big. Uh, we, I don't think we need to worry about what what can't happen or is unlikely to happen. What, what we want to do is accommodate what we what could happen, and it's not inconceivable that somebody might want to do a drive through something. The <laughs> so question is, do we, we want it in the hand right. core or not? Can we put it with approval of the town board or the planning board rather than just? say they can do it and you know just give them a, a blank check there say that we don't allow it but with approval special approval we will allow them to occur in other words a special permit as opposed to a site plan review yes we, we want to i mean i i get i don't know who said it before but i sort of agree with the notion of you know if we want in the core mm to have you know it more congested and more development and more things going on. If a drive through takes up that much space, um I sort of defeating yep. the purpose of having the core. Um and we should do it with maybe site plan, special permit in the not in the core, but in the neighborhood. No, <laughs> so no, what do you the, call uh, it? The non core yeah, hamlet. The, it's the, the non core uh, hamlet. <laughs> now, the, the weakness of site plan review is that it's basically a checklist. If you meet the said, conditions, or, you get it. I know. Yeah. That's yeah. why I yeah. said site plan or or special permit. But um, I, I think it. I don't think it goes in the core. A drive through. So, so, so let's ask. Oh, I try a simple vote. 
David, is it possible to do a uh, only if we say yes kind of scenario? No, it's not. Um, and that's one of the problems with the way some things in our current zoning are structured. So the current zoning does have what's called a special permit, a use allowed by special permit, which communities always hope means that they can decide on a case by case basis if they like that particular proposal, and if they're gonna allow it. It doesn't mean that um, you can't deny a special permit unless you have written out parameters in the zoning that say why you would say yes or say no. So if you, for example, allowed, um, um, let, I know this is silly, but it's getting late and it's all I can think of. Say you allowed uh, a ski, you allowed a skiing business uh, by special permit. And then you had conditions that it had to be located on a 15% or greater slope which obviously they would want. Um, you can't deny them for a reason other than the reasons that you put in the zoning for how you would review it. And lots of towns have put in really vague uh, criteria, like you know, it complies with the comprehensive plan or it meets with the character of the community. And that's when communities end up spending lots of money on attorneys because that's not a, a, a good way to make decisions that will give you a clear path to staying out of court. That's, that's the way that you end up in court. Um, so you really can't have a, have a category of, you know, it's only okay if we say so because the neighbors like it and nobody on the board has a particular problem with it. It has to, it has to have reasons why you would not permit something. Um, that give the board the ability to say no. Um, could we could we accommodate the drive-ins in the in the area outside the core orange, but within the within the uh, area on the main highway? That's in the light orange. Write write some good parameters. And right. We'll, we'll create a create a third create a third zone in effect it, you know a, a, a that allows for that kind of more space occupying business that doesn't really work in the hamlet. Mm -hmm. You we I think can a do third, that. Third zone is would be a good solution if somebody wants to put a dandy mart out where Rick Dobson used to live. Uh, that's uh, you know that whatever. That's, we're gonna that's have to way have too an close to the core for me. We're going to have to have an arm wrestling competition for who gets to decide what happens to Rick Dobson's parcel. Yes. Yeah. I think every yeah. special interest has their, <laughs> their eyes set on it, on it, whether it's for housing or for farm processing or for gas or for, you know, everybody, everybody wants to do something with that spot. Yeah. And the I, owner don't, I don't. I'd like to have it be open space. And Rhonda has her special interest that she'd like everything to be open space. So no <laughs> should, I there. think that'd be a great spot for a ski hill. I think fracking. <laughs> right. fracking. fracking. I think hang gliding. Ooh, yeah, I think we should yeah. have a shopping center behind the mountain. That's a good idea. Hand gliding. A zip, a line, water slide. zip line from the top of the hill. A water slide. <laughs> a water park. <laughs> yeah, water park. So I, because we're coming up on our time here, Joel, I do, I do want to give your question, um, I think the value of being answered, which is, can we just zone the entire, uh, what is it, two mile corridor um, to allow commercial development that's not walkable outside of the core areas? Um, and you can. Uh, I think you run the risk of really taking away um, any possibility of getting stuff in the core areas, but it may be that because we've, if we stick with zoning that's as flexible as what we have here for small incremental locally owned businesses that could come in with you no know, site plan review and pop up a tiny mm -hmm. building and, you know, start up with a food truck or a coffee trailer or something like that. Um, you know, that, that may not be incompatible as 
as long as you don't mind the fact that in between those or near those, you also have these, you know, you that may be where you get the Dunkin' Donuts wanting to come in or um, or one of those other uses. Um, yeah, the, 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 yeah the, the, the car dealerships, the uh, fast food joints, and the, the Miracle Mile things every, every town of any size has outside of its core area. Mm -hmm. Business sprawl. Yes. Here we are business, trying business. to zone in what do we get? So, sprawl, just what we're trying not to have. I don't think we have to Commercial sprawl as opposed that. to residential sprawl. Yeah. It'll, it'll be a while before we get a miracle mile in Danby. It will, but we are taking the long view. I mean, a long while. It's okay. Why in the world would, would anybody want to put a Burger King out here? So we do know that people already want to put a Dollar General out here. Oh, two, two, yeah. for sure. Right. And, you know, when, when we think about the reason that I, we've started with a Hamlet core that's so small and with retail requirements that keep things so small is that you know, the amount of demand that you have, uh, one Dollar General sucks up more demand than the entire town can supply. You could not have any other retail essentially at that point. Yeah. Um, and the same goes for uh, a dandy mart. If you wanna have a cafe or a restaurant or a convenience store of any kind, that dandy mart will take all of that demand and make it so that nothing else can be successful near it. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, so well, we can't say no to a dandy mart as long as they meet our checklist. Right. But well, we do have the commercial design guidelines, which are intended to make it well, so that if we ended up with the dandy market, it, would, it wouldn't look like a dandy mart or a Dollar General. Or, well, you know, it would make I them sign would make them sign look with, like with the, within the limits. It, right. It would make them look slightly different. Um, I'll have to look at sizes, but I think, you know, with our limit at 6,000 square feet, it's unlikely. Um, right, because that, that was your point last time, was that, you know, your, our size limit is low enough that it would be unlikely to be attractive to some of these, you know, dandy marts and Dollar Generals and the like. Well, yeah. If those are our two extremes, I would like to pretty much just say no to drive throughs because there is other alternatives to that. If there's some like places that would like to do takeout service or something like that, it doesn't have to be a drive through Any of these right. places would most likely have a parking lot, which means they can do what a million other places have done, which is have designated parking spots for carry out or yep. quick order mm -hmm. or whatever they call it, those kind of things. But I don't want to sacrifice the things that we are talking about, which would be supporting local yeah. smaller initiative type businesses that would be that we want here right yeah. you could do a drive up not a drive through yeah and i don't think there's a whole lot of difference other than you're not spewing a whole lot of gas into the air because you're not idling for five minutes <laughs> oh you're driving an electric car <laughs> <laughs> hopefully but when that happens in 10 years then oh uh, can can it, can we legislate that every parking area should have at least one or two charging stations in it? You that can. would be good. Um, I don't know if we can, but I thought code was going to do that in the next couple of years. So we can. I don't think it's a good idea um, because yeah. you don't actually need it. You know, I, I drive a plug-in car. I've had a couple... I charge my car at home and then drive wherever I want to go. Well, um, and if we were going to require, you know, um, Colleen to put in forty thousand dollars worth of car charging infrastructure in order to open a cafe, and it won't I don't think that that would be a, a good starting spot. On the other hand, if we simply required it, and she went to Home Depot. And bought a $500 charging station and offered it as a de minimis for free uh, benefit, just like air conditioning or a bathroom, 
she could bring in somebody who wanted to, you know, charge their car. Minimal cost to her. Yeah, Along with the charge it, to actually charge the car that's electric no, it, associated it's, with it's, that. It's a simple charger like that. The model is not that you're filling up your gas tank. It's that you're replacing what you used to do your, to do your little errand. I, I think that's, that's, not how people, that's not how people use it. Maybe, yeah, maybe we could think about that in the future. I feel, I feel like we're trying it's to come up zone. with something that encourages and, and stop putting, you know, too many requirements right. on that might deter people mm -hmm. from doing something small. Well, I then if the market, you know, if, if, it, if it turns out to be an attractive feature that would enable or attract business, then, the, the, you know, the market will, will move in that direction anyway without it mandating yeah. it. Yeah. I yeah. also think it would be a great. I think it would be a great thing to require in a parking lot of thirty or more spaces. I just don't think it's a good thing to require for in order to start a business. Um, so if, if somebody okay. wanted to come in and build, you know, something huge, then sure, we could have something that would require that. But I think it, if our point is getting people who uh, need to do things as kind of small scale as possible, we don't want to add a bunch of other requirements. Um, if we want to enable things, you know, we could, if we had to come back to Olivia's property, but you know, if we wanted to use the, you know, the church property or the town hall property or Olivia's property as a magnet, you know, an area that, a, a, a venue, um, you know, having municipal car charging stations located with those parking lots is something the town could do to facilitate and support the, the yeah. businesses business creation yeah and I, I do know that people come and park at town hall and go to the park and they would probably be happy to be able to go get a sandwich or buy a coffee or buy ice cream while their car is parked at town hall I, there's a few people it's a small number of people i always see the same people um, yeah but there are a couple people who do that um really i i, I want to be um uh Careful, I know that it is is time to be wrapping up and um, people have other things to do tonight. So uh, I know we haven't gotten very far in this. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to spend some time with the document and send me comments the way Olivia did. Um, you can track changes and send them to me. Uh, I Let me know if you want my answers to you shared back with the group. Um, the way I did with Olivia is I, I asked her before I did this because normally, you know, of course, everyone should know everything they send to me is now a public document as soon as you send it to me. But also, I won't put you on blast unless I talk to you. But anyone could request your emails to me at any time. So don't send me something that you think is your deep uh, state secrets. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I think that's a way that we can move forward um, with people engaging with the document a little more um, and have a more productive conversation at the next uh, meeting to move this forward. Nancy, I see you have your hand up. Uh, I do. So did we basically decide that we're not, we don't want drive-throughs in the Hamlet, the core Hamlet, but we're open to creating more commercial areas along the corridor where there could potentially be a business with the drive through Was that kind of where we ended up? I mean, I'm fine with that, but it would be nice to get some, we have a lot of great discussions and great ideas, but um, just some closure on some of these ideas would, or resolutions would be helpful that we don't have to talk about it again. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I think we do need to talk again about the concept of having a third zone. I, I heard some support and some concern, and it's something that I can draft yeah. and, and share, and we can talk about um, at a future meeting. Um, I, you know, this, this, um, this comes back to the point that I, I, I tried to make last time, or maybe in the time before, which is that we should be thinking um, in terms of what kind of businesses we are we we want to accommodate at all within the boundaries of the town of Danby, and and then looking at that list of things that we were okay with, we've already said we don't want heavy industrial. Uh, what, where would we put them? You know, and, and you know tonight's discussion underscores that not every business that we might think is okay in the town 
is easily accommodated within the hamlet without messing up the tightness of the development and you know and the and the walkability of it. But um, does that mean we don't want them anywhere in the town? Because we haven't really accommodated them outside of that um, very well. But that's why I mentioned that, that we should be really discussing a, a hemp store. I mean, a lot of them are popping up in very strange places, and do we? And they can be small, really small. And so, you know, people walk in, yes, they yes. buy their hemp and walk out. Do we want to allow that? It would create a lot of traffic. It and might. is that the kind of traffic we would want in, in the core of the hamlet? It might be great to have it right next to the park, don't you think? <laughs> I think I think it's way too big of a discussion next to, to the church. Into. Uh, after the church, right? After the end of the meeting, <laughs> it's definitely something to consider going forward. Believe it or not, those hemp, those CBD stores, and whatever are—they want drive-throughs. I hate to tell you that. <laughs> I do know this. I take it for me. I do know this as a fact. Not surprised. <laughs> All righty. Um, with that said, I, I hope everybody has a good weekend. Um, a reminder busy. that tomorrow, Rachel, the ag group is meeting at, at 11, 11 at the pavilion at the, yep. at the at the Danby Park. And the weather could be just as bad as it was last time. When <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Have a nice weekend. Yeah.